Hello everyone! I'm gonna just real quick call them out because they did it real quick, but you just missed an epic drink of beer. I'm guessing beer from both of these wonderful authors. <laughs> yes! <laughs> um, uh, we had uh, about two weeks ago an event with whiskey, so why not beer this time? <laughs> it was other like bar drinks. But anyway, welcome to another Mysterious Galaxy virtual event. I am Nick, the director of events. Of course, today we have our two wonderful authors for this evening's event, Julie A. Uh, Cherneda and Marie Bilodeau. Hello. Hello. Hey, hi. Delighted hi. to be here. Thank you. We, of course, are celebrating Julie's latest book, and today is the book birthday here in the States, To Each This World. Yay. Showing off that cover. Thank you. <laughs> For those who may not be aware, Julie was inducted in the Canadian Science Fiction and Fantasy Hall of Fame in 2022, this year of recording, if you're watching this in the future future. Uh, Julie's works combine her training and love of biology with boundless curiosity and optimism. Um, to Each This World, again, is her latest, and it is the uh, standalone science fiction novel. Uh, of course, in conversation, we have Marie Bilodeau, a French Canadian author and storyteller who writes mostly in English because her family would say she's contrary. <laughs> her, her her speculative fiction has won several awards and has been translated in Chinese and French, the latter her family is happy about. <laughs> For anyone watching there, if you have any questions you would like to ask these authors, um, you'll notice there's a link below that says ask a question, submit your questions there, and I will be popping on later in the, screen, uh, later in the program to ask those of Julie and Marie. And if you haven't yet bought your copies of To Each This World or any other of Julie's or Marie's books, you can actually click the link below. They'll take you to the event website where you can buy those. We ship across the world, across the country, so you have no excuse not to. And of course, if you do buy To Each This World, you get a lovely signed book plate already prepared by Julie, and we appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and disappear for now and leave it to Julie and Marie to take it away and discuss the novel and any other things, but I'll see you both for the Q&A section later on. Thank you, Thank you, Nick. Of course, what we really want is Nick's studio. <laughs> right? With right. that camera and that the lighting. Camera, that look, and the the smile. It's, it's, it's everything just, is yeah. all whole package. But you yeah. got us. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> oh, we're getting a laugh already. Oh, it's going to be that kind of night, guys. <laughs> We've been having fun. We've been having a great time. It's so nice to finally celebrate something like this in person. It is just, uh, I will hug Marie for you. <laughs> I am hugging Julie. So Julie, tonight we're here to celebrate the launch of To Each This World. Um, put your nails on it. Oh, look at that. Look at that. So we're celebrating on multi-levels. Yeah. So uh, this book, for those of you who don't know, uh, is amazing, which you should know if you knew Julie Tornado's work. You should. <laughs> You're getting comments on the nail polish. Oh, yes. thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we coordinated. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, this is a standalone novel, which is your third standalone novel yeah. of your career, which has been amazing and continues to be so for many, many years. Can I read the little back? Because I really like the back. Sure. Would you like to do a dramatic you. reading of it? Or would you I can do that. Do a dramatic reading do of the back. We'll reading start with that. Of one. the back. Yes. Here you go. Cool. Well, I want to talk about myself first. So <laughs> my first standalone novel for a while follows a desperate mission to reconnect with long lost sleeper ships sent centuries earlier from Earth to settle distant worlds. A trio of humans must work with their mysterious alien allies to rescue any descendants they can find on those worlds. Something is out there determined to claim the cosmos for itself and only on Earth will humans be safe or will they? The challenge isn't just to communicate with your own kind after generations have passed. It's to understand what isn't your kind at all and how far will trust take you when the truth depends on what you are. That was good. Oh, thank you. I didn't even practice. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I was there. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how this book came to be, kind of the inception of the idea and then the growth of that idea. Okay, uh, it started quite a long time ago, actually. I had an idea for a short story involving how to divide the biology of a planet. 
and to, to let one side uh, follow an evolutionary path different from the other side. And I liked the idea, I just didn't know quite what to do with it. So I put it aside for a while and I just kept adding bits and pieces, thinking a bit more about it. I mean, why would you do it? Uh, who would do it? How could you do it? And it took me quite a while and it was about, uh, well, it was um, five years ago that I felt I was close to getting ready to writing this, but I hadn't actually told anybody about it. And then as it happened, Sarah Megabo and I were talking about her representing me as my agent. And she said, well, I need a book proposal. Do you have one? And I said, give me a half hour. <laughs> and I whipped out a proposal on, on, on what I had in the folder. And I got more and more excited as I did it because uh, I was think I was ready. And she, she loved it. Sheila Gilbert at Daw loved it. So that was that. I was I was now to write this thing I'd, I'd quickly written a proposal about. <laughs> and it took me the five years really to uh, pull it together. That's amazing. That's really amazing. And it, how did it evolve since the proposal? Like the, the... Oh, yeah. It's quite, <laughs> just... it's quite different. Uh, I, I, I had this, this idea. It was a, I, I liked it. I had a big idea about a future in which we were meeting aliens and we, they were very confusing and, and and we were finding these planets that were divided and, and there was someone responsible for it. We didn't know who. And so it was going to be a mystery. I knew that. I wanted it to be also a bit of a fun romp kind of adventure as well. So I started the book writing it like a fun romp adventure and that was naturally not going to happen. So I went back to writing the way I would normally write a book, which is to develop the world and the characters and lead you with them into it. And, and I'm very happy with the result. That's amazing. And um, so uh, in the book, um, you have you have a lot of different um, different questions that you ask of it. And you ask big questions. We're going to go from fun romp into a big question. And then we're going to come back to fun romp to give you whiplash. Oh, uh, <laughs> oh no, what is she doing? What? So you have this like this amazing mystery at the heart of it, right? That this thrilling um, thing that we need to find out in the story, which is about humanity. How are people going to uh, survive? What's hunting them? You know, that there's a big like thrilling thing. But you also have these very very deep questions like what makes humanity humanity how can we tell what's human and what's not and how do we uh reconnect with you know differences especially centuries and worlds apart um and now i know i don't want you to spoil some of the amazing story um but it's a long book i don't think i could <laughs> so we'll read page 290 now you're good <laughs> Um, but how, how do you develop that? Like what's, what appeals to you on these questions? I knew it was, I had a big canvas to work with. I'm talking about, you know, t travel across time in the sense that these ships have been apart from earth for 200 years, hundred years away, hundred years for the message to come back that, Hey, we made it. Um, so I knew I would have, uh, about five to six generations of people. So I also went back and I did a lot of historical research in the kinds of changes that happen in isolated populations, in, in, in connected ones. And I also thought, well, if you're going forward, you're going to have a sense of what you want your world to be. So I wanted a little bit of that. So part of, of each is jumping from one world to another to another that have originally all started with the same point of a sleeper ship arriving with the technology on it to help them. Uh, a thousand settlers trained for their job asleep, and then they wake up and they start from that point. So as far as they're concerned, it's been 100 years. As far as Earth, New Earth is concerned, it's been 200. And so they've had enough time to have a flavor, but not enough time, which was deliberate on my part, to be too strange so that it would be almost impossible to communicate with them, although that would have been a fun one to do too. <laughs> the book. Couldn't be too long. I originally started with about 13 planets. I went, no, this is going to be an epic. It's already, you know, 150,000. It's a good size book. So <laughs> that's amazing. Um, so you don't just have humans, too. No. You have aliens I and do. you have really cool aliens. So <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to describe them to you. You can push me off the bench if I get anything wrong. Okay. So you. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> Pressure. <laughs> 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 so we call 911. Um, 
So <laughs> we have the Kmet, which are in orbit around New Earth. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they're very different than humans. And they see humans very differently. Like they can't tell people apart. Um, like they can tell humans apart one from the other and things like that. And, and, and that's kind of a theme that you have in a lot of your books. Like it's that that humans are often the other and um the other is more similar is often a point of view character like you have in your essay novels or is more similar than we know um or understand especially at the beginning mm -hmm. so you obviously have a lot of fun creating those species that and how they're going to interact with humans which are a touch point of what we understand mm -hmm. um so Give us a little bit about like what you love about the Kmet specifically, but also what you love about just developing alien species, because you are a queen of aliens. A queen of aliens. <laughs> queen of aliens. Who are you? Not the alien queen. Not the alien there you queen. Go. That's, no. That's very important. <laughs> it's very important. Yeah. Um, well, part of it is 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 just to play, you know, to play with what another intelligence would look like. Uh, how they might sense the world, the world that they perceive compared to what we do. Part of it, though, for me, is always about communicating. It's always about uh, when we meet and and where are the potential misunderstandings. And I think it's, it's it's much more fun when it's all about getting to the point where we think we know what we're doing. We believe we understand them. And we assume they understand us because they're giving us back the uh, responses that, that work. They're not perfect, but they work. And how badly can that go? And, and so with the command, it goes pretty badly. We really, they have an completely different idea of what their partnership with us entails as compared to what people think. And that makes it, uh, discovering that is, is one of the big mysteries in the story, but also peeling back those layers to make the commit make sense as well. That matters to me a lot that their, their biology and their way of being and their idea of what we where we fit in their lives matters you know to me to, to have that work out so and then there's mysterious aliens which you haven't met yet and i'm not going to tell anyone about because that would be spoilery but it's it's one of the big mysteries though and i'm it excited is one of the big mysteries and it's one of the big draws through the book too like where yeah i'm Cause, excited because the commander afraid of something they don't seem that they should be but when we discover that they are and they say it's a threat to Earth and to, to humans in particular. You, what choice do you have but to believe them? I mean, they've been your partners for forty years, and you've been working together. Mm -hmm. You, you assume they're there to be helpful, and then you wonder about that. <laughs> and you wonder about it a lot. Layers of mystery. Layers of mystery. Layers of mystery. But thankfully, the Kemet have coffee machines on their ships. I hear. <laughs> <laughs> ah, no, 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 no. Uh, one of the interesting confusions with Kemet and humans, they all they're communicating, they like to have one human to talk to and they call that's a government official called the arbiter. And he just gets that job. Uh, whichever arbiter is voted into it is is the Kemet's contact point. And, and no matter how hard this person tries with the resources available to him, linguistics, linguists and universities, they still haven't quite figured out how to explain to the commit that they'd like a coffee machine on the, on the portal. So you can bring one thing, like you fill out forms and you can bring something with you. So the poor pilot brings a toaster, she really wants her coffee pot. And so it's, it's just a, another way of just showing in a very small thing, you just don't understand each other yet, do you? You know, you're really not there yet. So it, it was an interesting bit. And that's, I don't think this is spoilery, but that's interesting too, because kind of linking humanity and aliens, you don't even have the humans themselves mm. or, or the arbiter doesn't go up as himself as a human. So you have another layer of what makes a human a human is you have that consciousness kind of transported into a body that can safely make the journey and, and reach the space. And, and even though there's a, a psychological cost there. Yeah, the, the idea of epitomes in which it's basically an avatar system where you a, a copy of you is grown and there's there's uh, hardware installed so that it can upload your consciousness while you're in space. Uh, I came up with that as a necessity because I had to have a reason why they hadn't gone after, like why the space program had stopped after sending these ships forward. So you needed something to stop them. And I thought, well... I want them to be wanting space, but I want them not to be capable in space. So I, I not to spoil it, I have a, a tragedy happen that sets human space program back in the sense that it goes all remote. 
So if you want to be a, you know, work in a space station, you go as an epitome, you know, the part of you is in a can and you're linked to a partner back on earth that you can talk to. So you have company in your head. And so this worked very nicely as a tool that I have just these two characters going out, but they're bringing with them their, their support mechanism as if you, if you wish. And sometimes that's a pain to have lots of people talking in your head. Sometimes you wish they would go away, but most of the time you need them. That's very cool. And that, <laughs> that just has that fun layer to it too. Like the, it does. the it whole does. book, like I haven't finished it yet. Um, I didn't get it. Oh, good God. Oh, yeah. enough. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> don't push me off the stool. That's true. We're perched on stools. I will, I will keep you safe. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the whole book feels like you take, you know, the reader's hand and you have this very different world that you introduce us with, bring us a main character that we understand, that we love, and then you start to bring us in and then, boom, mystery <laughs> after mystery after mystery, where you're like, ah, oh, I have to keep reading this beautiful book. It smells good. Um, it does smell good. It does smell good. It's nice. <laughs> <laughs> What makes they this do thing? that? You know, they put this nice smell in there. Do they? Yeah, yeah, it's right in that page. Oh, yeah, I see it's it. Right oh, it says lavender. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Trust me, it does not smell like that. It does not smell like lavender. It smells like ink, and we're probably getting high off of the smell, so we should stop smelling it during well, okay. the book launch. Um, <laughs> what did I just say? <laughs> it's your book launch. I'm just. You can do what you want. Do what I want to. Yeah, you have a new book out. I have a new book out. <laughs> so, how is this book different than your other SF books? Oh, it, it is different. It's different in the pacing. Um, I wanted to keep that, that idea of that adventurous romp. I wanted to keep that that tumble forward pacing, and I wanted the characters to be pushed by everything that's going on around them. They've got very little uh, say in the matter at first, and they find ways to have more agency, but right at first they're they're basically trying to catch up to what's happening. So that part of it is different. And that was a deliberate choice on my part. Uh, I just wanted to try that and I, I feel it works well. The other thing that's different is, and, and Sheila noticed that when she first read it, is the idea that we've, we're, we're retreating from space. Right. back home and and everything's about going forward and, and moving up to bigger and better things and in this case it's very much a sense of of, of an evacuation or a, a retreat it's a retreat to safety and you hope it's safe even that's up for grabs so that part of it was different from anything else i'd read and uh, or sheila mentioned that she'd read either so that was neat to hear um and i think i just uh it, it it's like company in a way but it's much less, um, there's a lot less people, there's a lot less uh, uh, time spent waiting for things to happen. Not that companies spend much waiting, but you know what I mean? It, it, this is a much faster pace. Right. It's a faster pace, but you have like, one of the things that you're known for, and you know, on social media as well, you kind of bring that energy is you have this very positive energy. And a lot of the stories with like sleeper ships and, and uh, you know, anything generational and anything leaving Earth tend to tend to go more towards a dystopic end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, where would you say you're on the, you know, optimistic? Oh, way past, way past that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, that's part of my motivation for writing it was that I, there are some out there that are not dystopic. It's very hard to find them. Um, I don't find it realistic. You know, the effort you make to get to space, the people you pick to go there, the opportunity that is ahead of people and drawing them forward, if they get half a chance, mm -hmm. uh, they will make, oh, thank you, Pat. Oh, hi, Patrick. Hey. <laughs> um, if they get half a chance, they will do their best and they will do, they will make something of themselves. It won't be, these aren't the people you're sending forth who are going to sort of say, oh, quick, there's only one Tootsie Roll left. I better kill you. Stab. You know, I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> I would never. I would never. Why do you have that I would never. Your head? <laughs> It's a kitchen. What can I say? Oh, that's true. <laughs> but so part of it is that I, I, I am not a fan of dystopia unless it, under the circumstances of it's we're just in another place. Why on earth is that suddenly going to be a disaster? Uh, why isn't it going to be amazing? Why aren't we going to find something remarkable and make, take advantage of it and, and make ourselves better for it? 
which makes it even harder than when Henry, the arbiter, has to go with the commit to these worlds and say to these people, you've got to leave now. You've got to leave everything behind and you've got to leave. You've got to come back to a, a place you, that's five generations behind you and you've never seen and, and uh, sorry, but you've got to go and you've got to go now or you're just toast. So to be, so it's, it's that, that combination of, of we're doing so well but now we've got to save you from your, you know, your, 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 your happiness in, in a sense. <laughs> and not that every one of the worlds they go to is, is in a good place. Some of them are grateful to be saved, but uh, others are not. They're, you know, I don't know how to leave. So it, uh, that was fun to play with as well. But again, it's not uh, a one size fits all. Everybody's going to be after each other. It was very much a, this is normal society. This is, uh, they've made the rules that work for them. And, and now they just have to accept a different reality. It was tomorrow. <laughs> That's cool. That must have been funny developing, like, you know, taking a point in time where everybody splits off and then, yeah, like, how yeah. the different cultures and humanities develop based on where they land and what happened and all that. Like, tell us a bit about that fun. It was fun. And one of the, um, so what the way I postulated is there's or, that our Earth sent forth this one or more sleeper ships that one of these set, started New Earth, and that's about 900 years ago. So that's a good amount of time. With you know, nice complete archives to get them started. So they've moved on and done their own thing. And they have their own tech. And they've sent these 200 year distance ships forth. So their distant time isn't so far apart. And they've picked and cho chosen what to keep and what not. So that part works well. And among them, they've chosen to keep science fiction movies from our era, because why would you not? Right? So there's uh, one of my favorite characters is uh, Henry's companion. It's uh, an AI construct, and it loves watching movies about flying saucers, and it actually builds itself into one. So I have a, an anachronistic flying saucer going through all of this, the book <laughs> to remind them of where they came from, and always to show that link hippity hopping back through humanity. And it's fun. I mean, who does not want to have a flying saucer in their book? <laughs> you now have one if you have my book. Which you should. Which you should. That made me laugh. I have to say, Thank you. that Thank made you. me laugh out loud. What's to you like, you're really good at writing those not quite human, fun, kind of wacky characters. Like it's like, <laughs> they just seem to come out of you. Like, do you plan for them? For no. <laughs> Well, Flip is, uh, that's the name of the AI construct, actually is my, my, one of my, my brother-in-law's fault because I asked my family members to give me some names to use in the book. I thought this would be a nice way to find names I hadn't thought of. And, and he gave me Flip, which I think is probably a little bit because his name is Philip. And then, you know, Flip. Okay. So that, that became facultative, linked, intelligent polymorph is the name of the construct. And he's called Flip. So, it, you know, thank you, Philip. <laughs> and it just evolved from there. That's just, that's fun. Yeah, it was. And I mean, I, I wanted that some humor. I also wanted to show that there was also that kind of alien life. The, 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 the AIs are, are on New Earth, um, voting members of society. They, they fully participate. They make decisions as well. So having that was interesting too. Right. You didn't want to just have them separated from what being a human and what being part of society is you wanted yeah. them to be integral which really yeah. shows in the story as well because flip is important he's very and yeah when you get to the end it's very important <laughs> and fun and okay fun. well i'm gonna go finish the book right now so you all just wait <laughs> so um you've been really good following me down this rabbit hole Thank so you. now i'm gonna give you a treat <gasps> a treat <laughs> I know you have a cheat sheet, so I'm ready. I do. So uh, tell us about the names. Ah, How you came names. up with them. Show off your naming system, Show space, naming because it's system. really cool. Like, okay. This well, is the mind of Julie Ternado, my friends. Well, I knew building this world that there were a few things I didn't want to do. I didn't want it to sound like any of my other books. I wanted it to link back to our world um, in a very concrete way. I wanted the... Uh, people to actually, and it's not reverence, it's respect for and a desire to remember. So, for example, um, who have I got here? Oh, yeah. 
So the first name is just a first name. Uh, some of them, like Henry, the main character, is my husband's middle name is Henry, and Beth, my middle name is Elizabeth. So, you know, I just pick family names. Um, but for uh, one of the characters, it's Liam McPherson Sinochkik. And the first name is just the name. The middle name is your aspiration based on the archives. So it's for Lester B. Pearson because he, he aspires to be that kind of a politician, a, pol a diplomat. And the last name is the most popular name in Hungary, surname right now. So what I did was every name has a last name that's uh, the most popular name in a country on this planet, a middle name that relates to a historical character in our world. I have uh, Kisho Mahadfield to twist. And Hadfield is, of course, Chris Hadfield, our delight, wonderful, you know, astronaut, turned author, musician, lovely person. <laughs> so yeah, and I mean, people very rarely use all these names. They just refer to each other by their first names and, and to make the book a little easier to read. But if you want to delve into it, there's the first, I've got the first woman uh, professional astronomer in the US. Her name is in there, Mitchell. And uh, the, the pilot's name is Killian Melamar to Brown. And Lamar is for the actress, uh, Lamar, who is also an inventor. So, you know, I just I had fun. I, I picked historical characters that I felt would be memorable and, and or obscure. You know, I've got the woman who invented the car heater. Uh, she's an African-American, um, you know, <laughs> who did that. I thought, that is so cool. You're going in my book. <laughs> so there's a lot of, of, of uh, Easter eggs, I guess. That's very historical cool. Easter eggs in the names. And all the starships, all the all the uh, the ships that have headed off, all the sleeper ships, are named like where I was born, where Roger was born, um, where my parents met, where his parents met. So they're all very personal, everything like that. So I, I had I, I put a lot of work into that because I wanted that feeling to the book. I wanted that texture of it being very much uh, a very intimate book. That's nice. And it really shows. So now, do you put a lot of that work ahead of time? Do you do a lot of it beforehand? Or do you just kind of go as you're writing it? You're like, I need. <laughs> I have learned my lesson <laughs> that if I want to do a naming system like that, I have to prepare. Uh, at the very least, I have to be ready with, with the names ready to go. So what I did was I prepared a list of, of historical figures in science and astronomy and math, uh, diplomacy, linguists that I might use. And then I prepared this list of names for my family, for first names, and a list of last names is, is easy enough to Google. You can Google the most popular name in Poland right now. Uh, and the most popular name in, uh, most common name, pardon me, in uh, Australia is Brown. Who knew? Hmm. So, you know, I, I learned a lot. <laughs> so I did that prep. Um, and I certainly did a lot of the science and the technology prep, uh, the astronomy, the world building, like the literal planet building, that kind of thing hmm. ahead of time. Now, why did you write this book? Like, what does this book mean to you as a writer? That's a big question. No, no, and, it, and it's not a bad question. Part of it was that I've written, <laughs> oh, a for effort, <laughs> good question. <laughs> uh, part of it was because I love the books I've written. I love all the books I've written. Um, several of them come together in series. They all started with a standalone book that became a series, um, which is, you know, some books can do that, some books cannot. And it was far by far uh, time for me to write a standalone science fiction. I really felt that. It had been 20 years since In the Company of Others, uh, and I was looking forward to doing that. I've been hoping to do this particular book as a standalone, as a big, a big epic, didn't know I had it in me book. If, if, if it comes to that. Uh, so that's, that's probably most of it. Um, and I think uh, I just knew it was, it, I feel it's a really great story. I just felt like I really wanted to tell it. That's beautiful. Thank you. That's really beautiful. I mean, it was long in the making too, because you've been thinking about this I've been thinking for, about a for a long time. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> which, is, which is good and bad. I mean, sometimes you, you think about a story so long, you feel, I've already written that, I'm moving on. <laughs> I'm done. I'm done. It's been I'm done. years. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's the process. It's fun too. That's lovely. Um, and uh, you also have, um, just switching us a little bit here this way, you also have a short story collection that came out recently. I do. I do. I do. I do. It just happens to be here. 
<laughs> By surprise. <laughs> oh, and look, it's even popped up oh, into the they That's have it. Nick. That's what Nick did. That was Nick. Thank well you, done, Nick. Nick. So yes, this is uh, a collection. There are 23 stories in it, plus a, a nice chunky brand new novella for Night's Edge for those who follow my fantasy. And it's uh, it even has horror in it. Oh. Yes, I just picked all the things I've never really, you know, things that were challenging, things that were fun, and put them all together. And the, a beautiful cover by my husband, Roger Chmeda. Always a, a pleasure. So yeah, so that's just out too. And for the 25th anniversary, we wanted to do something that seems like a very nice thing to do. A little something to mark the occasion. To mark the occasion, yeah. 25. Yeah. Oh, I see a gasp. <laughs> oh, gasp, that's lovely. Gasping is excellent. I think oh. it's a good gasp. It's like a ghost gasp. It's, it's. I mean, he's got a good camera and a good light, so it's like probably a happy gasp. It's probably a happy gasp. It's a happy gasp. Yes, yes. Um. <laughs> no. <laughs> there. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, good. Now, I know that you have um, uh, tomorrow night you're reading at Ephemera. Yes. Uh, so Julie made it very clear she was not doing a reading tonight. Um, <laughs> that we were just conversing, which we were conversing. With. Except you made me read the back of the book. I did. I did. <laughs> I was very sneaky. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted a dramatic reading. I gave you There you go. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to tell people about this book? Like anything that you're like, you need to know this because... I am very proud, happy, fulfilled, um, distressed, <laughs> concerned. No. no, 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 no. I think it's. Um, I I think you you'll you'll I think you'll fall in love with the characters. I hope you do. I know I did. I think you'll find that even when it seems at its darkest, that there's some hope gleaming. Um, and I promise that I will not leave you. Uh, standing on an empty world. See, that's, I like that. That's important to know. And um, Nick Nick's fuzzy his... now. I'm not sure yeah. anymore. Are you even Nick? <laughs> oh, oh, there, there he is. is. <laughs> that must have been on your internet end because I look fabulous on my end. <laughs> <laughs> oh, should blame our internet. <laughs> <laughs> sure, play Canada. Isn't that a movie? <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> It is time, everyone. If you have any questions you would like to ask Julie and Marie, uh, please submit them below to the Ask a Question button. I'm going to go through some of those right now. First question, Julie, how much of the research uh, or world lore that went into each of this world have we not gotten to see in the book? <laughs> good. good question. Good question. Um, oh, right beside me happens to be the journal of the world building and so a lot of that is not in the book um but i would say i i was very targeted in my research for this uh partly because i was working on other things at the same time partly because i knew exactly what i needed i needed to know how to make a very very large thing float i needed to know how to make um how to divide a planet, what kind of mechanism. Uh, so I, I, I picked those things and, and follow where they led me and then, then that was it. And then I'd move on. Uh, so for that point of view, and the, and the one of the, uh, the interior of the portal where a lot of the action happens is, is, is very alien and very strange. You can't really research that. You basically just say it's very alien and it's very strange. And there's things walking around carrying weird things. And you don't know why. Um, and so you know, this kind of thing, it doesn't take much research. It just takes like be consistent. Do you have like a notebook like that for every one of your books? Are they that size? Are they bigger? Are they smaller? They, well, the one for company is about twice the size. Oh. Uh, but I think part of it is that, as I was, I was saying to Marie earlier, I, I've actually learned the kind of journaling I need to do. So there's a lot less that's um, uh, unfocused. So I knew I needed a section for Comet Biology. I knew I needed a section for each of the planets and for the names and things like that. So I just filled that in and populated it as I went by. So that helped a lot. That did. Um, my very first journal was for Thousand Words for Stranger, my first book, and all it had in it, I still have it, is the name of the disc and the pages that are on that disc. So I could put all 12 discs together in the computer and, you know, have the floppy ones. So 
<laughs> and when I was revising, I had to know which which part of the book was on each disc. Oh my goodness! <laughs> so so journaling has come a little further now. <laughs> Just a tad. That it the the way you're describing it is like memories to installing like Windows ninety eight. Like install disc one, install disc well, two yeah, now. Yeah. Well, you didn't spell, you have to put in the spell of this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, that's how I started. Well, actually, yeah, I started on, a, on an IBM like, type. I started on a typewriter. But uh, so, so it's, uh, yeah. So, no, it's come a long way. I, I, I knew this would be a, a very important tool for something uh, big and complicated like this book is in terms of world building. Because the more complicated the world, the less complicated it should seem. Mm. It's, you know, I mean, if, you, if you've done it right. So you're right. A lot of it's behind the scenes. A lot of it's in there. How often do you ever revisit or look at your uh, journals for, you know, future works or something you're working on now? Uh, it was funny. I, I, I actually went through it in case there was something in there that I wanted to show Marie in particular. And I came to this page with really weird sideways writing that said something about a sequel. And I crossed it off 17 times. <laughs> so clearly at one point I, I, I had a thread I thought I'd keep going. And I went, no, <laughs> not that. <laughs> and you're like, never mind. This is not happening. <laughs> that was a really dumb idea. Sequel. <laughs> you heard hear Patrick. You. We got to do it now. <laughs> so, do you prefer standalones or series books? Um, I think I tend to think in terms of trilogies when I write most of the time, um, because if I've got a really big story that's a nice amount of, of, of room to play with. And as Sheila, my editor will tell you at least three times, I contract two books and she said, are you sure it's not three? And I'm halfway through the second book and I'm saying, Sheila, and she says it's three. So she sort of led me that path as well. Um, I like a story that has a really strong ending. So the Essen books, I don't want to ever end. So they're ongoing forever, but the clan Chronicle series, I knew it had a sharp end. And uh, Company was a single book, that was for sure. Mage was, again, it had to be a single book. So some books just are solitary. Um, this one, I always felt that would be the same way. I don't prefer, I don't have a preference so much. It's just, it's, you do the same amount of work, <laughs> you have one book instead of three. <laughs> not quite. Not quite. <laughs> that is fair. Um, I think this would be interesting to ask both of you. Do you have any themes that you like to or try to weave into your stories and into your different books? I'd like to know this for both of you. You go first. Oh, um, for me, I like the um, I like the idea of finding home and redefining home, like the whole found family thing, like on the character point of view. Um, on the world building point of view, is I like the idea of old stories that are taken as fact, whereas along the way, you know, they they've changed and and how those stories have changed impacts everything that's now taken as a fact. I just, I just absolutely love that idea, especially like, you know, even old myths or anything like anything like that, what actually is the truth. And I also love when characters don't find what the exact truth is, um, because I think something should remain squishy and unknown. I love it. And you do it so well. I'm a huge fan, huge, huge fan. Thank Buy all you. of Marie's books right now. Just stop everything. Buy all of Marie's books. You heard it here now. Go in the checkout. I, I, do it now. Do it now. I won't push you off your stool. I promise. <laughs> I don't know. For myself, um, I'm, I'm always looking for to write what I'm not finding uh, in another book. And sometimes it's that sense of wonder, but sometimes it's all about uh, friendships and the importance of them and the importance of, of family. Uh, the way we... Uh, you know, how we, we, we strive and do our best when it's really hard. And we try to, to, to do better if we fail. And I, I, if I have themes, I think it is about that, that persistence. And the other theme, I, I pretty much in all my books, is that nobody ever wins. Nobody necessarily loses. It's, it's all about finding the balance and finding a way forward that includes everyone and everything, if possible. It's, it's far more interesting, and I think it's a little harder to write, but I, I like it. I like that. And you do it very well. Well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next question. Uh, what are you currently reading or have recently read? Ooh. 
<laughs> well, I'm not going to get up and run and get it, but I'm currently reading uh, High Times in the Low Parliament by Kelly Robson. It's, uh, it's a wonderful book. I'm really, really enjoying it. And my other read is Immense, An Immense World with by uh, Ed Young, which is the nonfiction on uh, animal senses. And it's, it's, it's so yummy. It's so yummy. <laughs> Everyone wants to have it. <laughs> what about you, Marie? Um, I have been reading this, um, <laughs> to be quite and frank. Ching, keep reading yeah. that. Excellent, and I, forever. And I'm loving it. Um, so yeah, this is honestly what I am reading right now, and I am loving it. Um, I am about, I'm about here. Oh, maybe oh okay. Oh, I like the title of the chapter. <laughs> we, we won't, won't yeah. go ahead. We won't know till we get there. <laughs> <laughs> Very appropriate. <laughs> Now, I'd like to know this this last question, unless anyone has any others that they want to put in. Uh, what's next? What are you working on now? I think everyone would love to know what you both might be working on now or deciding to maybe get started with. Sure. I am. Uh, I'm actually wearing a, the, the Niim turtle from Meridel because I'm now back to writing a few more fantasy novels set in my Night's Edge series. And maybe there'll be something else being done at the same time, but that's my main focus right now. So the next one is called The Change of Place, and it comes out in 2024 from DAW. Ooh. Yay. Thank you. I'm excited. It's going to be fun. Um, Did I mention that there are tidal pools <gasps> and trains? Ooh. Oh, I know. It's going to be so much fun. <laughs> Give now. <laughs> um, I am working with uh, on an IP and intellectual property right now that I'm not at um, liberty to speak about because that is NDAs. <laughs> in, in, in so many NDAs, but uh, it is a um, I can't say that it is an anti-hero story, um, and it is very different than anything I've ever written. Uh, it is kind of dark and very cool, uh, all in their world that I'm helping to develop right now. Uh, and so keep an eye out. Uh, I look forward to being able to scream about it. It's almost done. Yes. And keep an eye out for, for a collaboration between us one of these days. There you go. You heard it here. Yeah, you heard it there. You heard it there. We would totally fun. love that. Yeah. It would be insane. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> I want to see it become a series. Ah, there you go. It's getting bigger all the time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, that's great. All right. I think we have reached the end of our questions here, unless anyone has any last minute ones. Uh, until then, though, I would love to know where can people track you on social media so they can keep track of these things you're working on and get those little notices. Oh, uh, I'm Marie Billado on Twitter at Marie Billado. I also have a Facebook page and you can find me on Instagram under Glitter Bomb Billado. I have cats. <laughs> <laughs> Internet's made of cats. It's all good. <laughs> and you can find my uh, website is chadeda.com. And I'm on Twitter and Instagram as Julie Chadeda. And Facebook, I have uh, like a, a regular page and I have a fan page called Julie Chadeda Fan Page, where I do a lot of talking. And I've got a writer group there if anyone was interested in that too. Wonderful. <laughs> I must be honest with you. I've been waiting for R2 in the back to like start moving and like beeping because he's like yeah. dead center and staring at us. He's a cookie jar. Yes. <gasps> he's a cookie jar? It's not just a cookie jar. It's the original cookie jar from when the movie was released, cookie jar. Oh my gosh. Wow. So that's a valuable yeah, yeah. We were jar. letting the kids play with it and we went, they shouldn't really do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you take care of that cookie jar. <laughs> we take care of the cookie jar. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Don't forget, if you haven't yet got your own copy of To Each This World, you can still do so. You can either buy online or visit the store here. You'll get a nice signed book plate by Julie Trinada while supplies last. We also have on the website all of other Julie's books, um, as well as Marie's, so you can go ahead and order those. Uh, if you're watching this in the future on recordings, um, you can go ahead on our website. We should have some links on the listings below on how to get there. But yeah, thank you so much, Julie. And thank you so much, Marie. I wish you luck, Julie, on your other events. It sounds like it's going to be a fun reading tomorrow. It is. And thank you so much. It means a lot. Mysterious Galaxy is one of those very special places of the world. And thanks for all you do. Thank you. Good night, everyone.
Bye. Bye.